School Transportation Nation. Tony Corpin here. We're glad you're back to the podcast, School Transportation Nation. It's brought to you every week by TransFinder, the leader in school bus routing software. We've got our sponsor, First Student, one of the nation's leaders in student transportation solutions, and also our friends at Vera Mobility are our sponsors this week as well. We have a special guest, Kimberly Ellis, Director of Transportation for Marietta City Schools in Georgia. Just a bit, Ryan's going to be talking with her. So excited for that conversation. But before I get to the headlines with editorial extraordinaire, Ryan Gray, I've got a message from First Student, the nation's leader in student transportation solutions. First Student's approach to transportation provides your district with a local team with a national support network, collaborative planning, and customized services that keep your fleet operational and your students safe. First Student moves more passengers per day than all U.S. airlines combined. Caring for students is their top priority. And as the leader in electrification, they recently reached another major milestone by driving 1 million electric miles. Guys, you can learn more by visiting firststudentinc.com. That's firststudentinc.com. All right, Ryan, let's dive into the headline this week. We're excited to have you here and uh, you got some good stuff for us, right? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, speaking of first student, you're talking about their electrification efforts, like 30,000 vehicles, I think by 2035 is their goal. Well, bold. it's bold. A lot of that is being driven by the clean school bus program. Obviously, now that first student and other contractors are eligible under that sub program. Um, so we reported on it. It's, you know, they had the first listening session for that NOFO. Um, I love that acronym. Last week, sat through that. A lot of it, you know, we already knew kind of what I got out of that was a lot of questions. I mean, a lot, Tony. There was tons of folks asking questions. I I wanted to put uh, our link to uh, the article uh, in there for some of the folks to read. But, you know, a lot of folks trying to to get specifics on what that competitive grant means to them. EPA uh, laid out the uh, difference um, between, you know, the rebate program that they had last year and and this uh, new competitive uh, grant that is now open. And of course, it runs through August 22nd uh, is when you can get your applications up. Uh, So lots of folks really eager, Tony, to to try to figure out how they can get some more buses. It's exciting, Ryan. Yeah, I think there's a lot happening, obviously, in green. We got SCN Expo Indianapolis, like, what, two and a half weeks away. We're going to be in Indy with everybody for Green Bus Summit, SCN Expo, a lot of excitement, lots of content, lots of people are coming together from around the industry, kind of culminating there. And then we also have uh, SCN Expo and Green Bus Summit in Reno, July 14th through the 19th, which have our early bird Save 100 deal going through June 9th. So, Super excited for that, Ryan. There's so much happening. I know we're working diligently on the upcoming June issue of the magazine, which is going to have a full uh, outline of the SC and Expo Reno mm-hmm. uh, agenda with all the happening. So uh, I know we're we're very busy over here at STN lately. Exactly. And head over to stnexpo.com to check out the Reno uh, agenda that is up online as well. So you can take a look at that. Of course, we're still finalizing a lot of details, but it gives you a really good uh, uh, look at what we have planned. And and one of the things we have planned, Tony, is you know back to this Clean School Bus Program, we're going to have another EPA representative there along with folks from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, you know, an, an arm of the Department of Energy there to talk a lot more about uh, the competitive grant. I mentioned uh, earlier that uh, those applications are due August 22nd uh, at 11.59 p.m. Eastern. I know Clay Batko, who is one of the administrators of this program for EPA, said, you know, he he kept repeating it and said the other day that uh, he hoped that people could recite it uh, in their sleep by the time he was done. Um, But, what you know, I was mentioning some of the differences between the competitive grant and last year's rebate. And, you know, again, there's going to be another rebate coming out later this year. But with this competitive grant, it's going to, it's a longer process, both in the grant funding and allocation, as well as what it takes to put together that grant. So a lot of the conversation in that first uh, information session call uh, talked about getting started now, you know, going on to uh, grants.gov, going onto that sam.gov site to make sure that you have all of your information input 
The good news for folks that applied uh, in the rebate last year, they're already set to go. Um, but that application process is longer for the competitive grant. So uh, please uh, be forewarned about that to make sure that if you want some of that money, uh, that you start getting your ducks lined up in a row now. Yeah, lots happening there, Ryan. I know last week, uh, Lion Electric reported their earnings for Q1 2023. They highlighted uh, 220 vehicles being delivered. And so that was interesting. And, uh, you know, in terms of the mix, they talked a little more about kind of their order book. So a total of 1,100 vehicles on the road. And this would be a blend of medium and heavy duty urban vehicles, of which 295 trucks and two 2,270 buses representing the combined value of $625 million based on their management's estimates, which is interesting. So sounds like they're selling a lot of buses. Mm -hmm. They're on order. So, you know, they're pushing forward with their Lion C zero emission school buses at their Joliet factory. Um, That's starting to spin up. We're starting to hear more about it. They had their lithium ion batteries for medium and heavy duty vehicles in Canada that they're producing. They kind of had cut the ribbon on their factory uh, a few weeks back. So there's a lot happening from some of the manufacturers. So it's always interesting to see these earning reports because they really give you a lot of detail on what's happening. Um, And, you know, Mark Bedard, who's the CEO, came out and just said, hey, they're pleased with the Q1 performance, uh, increased number of vehicles being delivered for the sixth quarter in a row, which, you know, that kind of aligns with some of the trends we're seeing, Ryan. I mean, it's still at the infancy stage, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. market penetration really hasn't gotten quite there with EV, but we're definitely seeing more orders, more interest. People are doing their homework. Uh, You know, that's why we have Green Bus Summit, too, to bring everybody together to have big conversations with all the players to make educated decisions about how do you proceed is ev right for you maybe it's propane maybe it's cng maybe it's diesel right i know you were talking a lot about renewable diesel with uh, the guys from nesty at the act expo and it's so funny i'm in la and i'm i'm driving over the weekend and i saw a gas station just a run of the mill 76 station it said renewable diesel i i was shocked mm-hmm. right i was like wow in california you can actually get it at just a run of the mill gas station Absolutely. so super curious to see how maybe that fuel proliferates throughout the country. I know it's only available in very particular like California, but we may see it grow, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So I mentioned in a last week's podcast that, you know, coming out of, uh, Act Expo, that was one of the things that really jumped out to me was there were a lot of sessions and granted, you know, go to the exhibit floor and everything was battery electric or hydrogen seemingly. But a lot of the discussions in the sessions around low carbon fuels, renewables, um, those kind of things, you know, and, you know, because it's no secret that we need to reach a le- that level of maturity that you're talking about, you know, um, still in that infancy stage and, you know, price parity. I mean, th- we're looking at you know, how companies run their businesses, how school districts, you know, try to adhere to the budgets. Still, that sticker shock is pretty overwhelming, especially when you're looking at the school bus market and considering that it's called the tip of the spear for electrification or one of the tips of the spear. It's, uh, you know, it's going to take a lot and there needs to be alternatives. And there are alternatives now. We know that propane and CNG meet the uh, EPA 2027 regs for their further, uh, you know, reducing emissions from diesel engines. Uh, we know diesel is, you know, waning, but we're, it's still going to be around for decades. And uh, we need to have a, a source to uh, fuel those buses and those trucks in particular. And, you know, what we need from renewable diesel is we need it everywhere, not just on the West Coast. Um, and, you know, I, I spoke with Matt Luke um, at Neste uh, at, at Expo and I'm working on getting an, an article on, on that. But he and others, or he and I talk about Neste, Chevron's involved, ExxonMobil. You have some big players, some, some international companies that are very heavily involved in renewables, renewable diesel, renewable natural gas, renewable propane, renewable CNG is here, renewable propane still being worked on to really, you know, prove that use case, but renewable diesel is also here, but like I said, it's only really available 
on the West Coast unless you really want to pay a, a, an additional premium. Because renewable diesel, it has costs a little bit more than regular d- diesel. Those are coming about in parity now, but it's just not available in the middle of America and elsewhere where it needs to be. So I know Neste is working on things to try to, to get that uh, production ramped up. The entire renewable diesel industry is looking at 5 billion gallons a year in the next couple of years. That's kind of their next target. So that certainly uh, would, will help. Well, there's so many programs, Ryan, that are out there that are helping subsidize, put up new companies, look at new technology, build up, right? We have the Inflation Reduction Act. There's a lot of legislation in there that actually helps companies in the green world, right, get propped up. But the name of it is kind of confusion, right? The IRA, you know, you're like, wait, how does that have anything to do with green energy? Right? Irish Republican Army? Like the, 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 <laughs> the, the, what, what is this? But, you know, you're right. You know, it's um, it's a little bit of a misnomer. I think, obviously, the politicians being politicians – we're in the middle of these humongous, you know, inflationary pressures. They wanted to capitalize on that. But, you know, it is it it is geared towards tamping down inflation, but more so it's looking, like you said, to propping up business, uh, giving them the money that they need for an R&D to advance a lot of these technologies, giving them tax incentives. So, you know, we're it's going to take a while, too, to see those laws really go into effect um, and start impacting operations and manufacturing. Um, in fact, you know, another bill, the Chips and, and Science Act, that really looked at uh, chips and uh, battery production here in the U.S. Um, I was talking with John O'Leary, who's the president and CEO of Diamond Truck North America. A lot of folks remember him from his days as the president and CEO of Thomas Built Buses uh, 11 or so years ago. You know, he was talking about how it's going to take time before that money really trickles out and it takes time to build battery plants, right? And to your point, I mean, you know, again, north of the border still, but, you know, Lion Electric, they they just cut ribbon on their new plant. I was told by the folks over there, it's likely going to be uh, opening late this year, uh, early next year. So we'll start to see uh, those batteries start to hit. And, you know, Mark Bedard was telling me that he said they have the, the minerals, the resources there in Canada necessary to make those lithium ion batteries. So, you know, there's been a lot of talk about China owning all the, the resources worldwide, I think like 90, 95%. So, you know, Lion uh, certainly seems to be um, aligning itself to take advantage of its resources and, you know, the industry too, looking to be able to ride the coattails on that. And it would be interesting to see too, you know, how proprietary that is. We haven't really haven't gotten into the details of that. And I want to, but just, you know, a lot happening and a lot will continue to happen. Yeah, it's interesting, Ryan. More and more activity around green energy. It's still dominating the landscape in terms of topics and discussions. But here we go. A lot of people somehow then they hear about a bad experience. And what's interesting to me is some of the stories you hear, even though if someone maybe had a bad experience, they characterize it as a bad experience as an electric bus, not necessarily a particular manufacturer or infrastructure charging partner, just they generalize and they create this kind of halo effect because everybody in this industry, you know, a lot of people know each other and we talk, right? And, and the fact is, is that if one person has a bad experience, it gives you cause to maybe pause and say, is this right for me? Is this right for my district, my operation, my business? And maybe we should maybe take a step back and really think about what the best approach is. And I think you have to take it with a grain of salt because you don't know what the, all the circumstances are around that particular person's deployment or, or who the partners were in detail, right? Unless you dove deep. And and this is kind of where I don't want misinformation to get dispersed and that's have to be really careful about that kind of stuff because it becomes rumor and hearsay and oh i heard this happened to x district right there's these issues that come up and i think it's just human nature to share and be curious but we have to be careful that the information we're consuming is accurately represented, right? And I think you you also have to just think about that. That's why at STN, we do a really good job and we take a lot of care in the information we present to you guys. 
because it's important that you get a fair and balanced reporting of what really is happening out there. And we really do try uh, to make a really big effort to educate you on all the things happening. stnonline.com has got so many stories about the subject. You go in the search bar, type in a topic, type in electric buses, type in alternative student transportation, type in infrastructure. You'll see a plethora of resources. That's videos, podcasts, stories, special reports, stuff in the magazine. It all kind of culminates in that one place. So be sure and use this as a resource. It's super important that you guys take the time do the homework. Don't listen to hearsay and rumors. T- take your time with this. It's a big investment. It's a big move to try to make this uh, happen at your district. But we do see a lot of movement, Ryan. And, and I'm quite curious to see where this thing really catches fire. And, and really, we start to see triple digit, like five digits, right? 10,000 mm-hmm. plus electric school buses on the road. I, I'm, I really don't, based on those lion numbers, no. man, I feel like that is probably not unrealistic in the next two years or less. Well, you know, John O'Leary again over at Daimler told me at ACT, uh, and you can read his full, my full interview with him in School Transportation News uh, in June, so just in a couple of weeks. It's really, you know, in, from his estimation, it's going to be about price parity. You know, and a lot of folks think that. And it's, it's going to be, he told me, when the, the same or about the, the same outputs that we're seeing today in diesel and these other fuels, we're seeing that in electric or hydrogen for that matter. And again, he's talking a larger ecosystem there that he's now in charge of. Um, but like you told me, uh, school bus still remains near and dear to his heart. And he had, looks back fondly on his days leading uh, Thomas built buses. I mean, he was there when the safety liner C2 launched. He, he was part of that whole launch. And granted, I know the plans were born many, many years before that, but he, but he was at the helm. So that's what it's really going to come down to. We need to see all of these different price pressures, the inflationary pressures, the supply chain, which is improving. But, you know, hopefully get back to a little bit of, of the old normal, I guess, where it can really, along with all of these incentives that we're talking about from IRA and the Chips and Science Act and these and different legislative programs and regulatory programs and funding that really give the incentives to these manufacturers to develop the technology and bring the price down. So also at ACT Expo, Matthias Karlbaum, the president and CEO of Navistar, he was on on hand to actually you know share news of what I'd mentioned last week that IC Bus and International Brands um, are working with this Qantas Services to really do this one stop shop infrastructure consulting solution, holding districts' hands throughout the entire process, working with utilities, almost like from a standpoint of like what we think of as like a general contractor. So, but anyways, Matthias was there and he made a, a similar point. You know, he was noting that that IC Bus and International. They're committed to reaching 50% zero emissions by 2030, you know, again, if battery capacity allows it, um, and that most vehicle segments are expected to reach TCO or total cost of ownership during the same time frame. And at that point, he said, nothing will hold this zero emissions industry back. He said, you know, what's really going to be the, the, the push here is there's, again, back to so much of the regulation um, and the, the OEMs, they're all trying to, to surpass that, right? They're, th- this is like a bare minimum. This is like a benchmark that they're trying to pass because then you get into competitive advantage too. It's the right thing to do, but the, the company that wins, you know, if there is such a thing, will be able to have that, you know, zero emissions proven solution at that price point first. But he said, you know, we just asked to be told what to achieve, Trust that the automotive sector solves the question of how to do it. So again, back to innovation. It's all these incentives, all of these programs, uh, just trying to kind of level the playing field so that it could really you know, open these companies up to do what they do best, and that's create. Yeah, I know, Ryan, you had passed along some other top headlines that we seem across at uh, National Express. It's changing its name. I kind of was like, oh, wow, I wonder why they're doing that. So I know you had a little more information on that topic. Yeah, well, it was actually National Express Group PLC. So it's the, you know, daddy National Express that owns National Express LLC, that's, of course, based here in Illinois, in the U.S., and operates Durham School Services, Peterman Bus, Stock Transportation, and half dozen or more other 
um, local school bus contractors as well as transit and motor coach and bus and you know bus and shuttle but it's it's actually the Birmingham England company that's changing its name to Mobico M O B I C O to quote better reflect the group's international nature and its diverse range of mobility services as it continues to lead the modal shift to mass transit it goes on to add that quote unquote significant customer facing brands like Durham uh, it calls them out. It calls out Peterman, We Drive You, which is a U.S. motor coach and shuttle operator. They're going to continue to have their name. They're going to retain their names. Um, it doesn't mention these others. Now, I did reach out at this uh, recording to National Express LLC here in Illinois for comment about what this means to others. I did not hear back. Um, I'm sure I will soon. We'll have an article up uh, on scnonline.com. I'm sure by the time you hear this, you'll you'll read all about it. But we don't know exactly if National Express LLC here will also become Mobico. It's kind of, you know, well, we'll see. The The bigger thing here is, yeah, they're, they're going to change the uh, corporate's going to change their, their ticker symbol. But at least the Durham and, and Peterman bus brands, as this industry has grown to know it, are remaining the same. All right, Ryan, you heard of the dynamic duo? I have. Batman and Robin from the old 60s show. Bang, boom, pow, right? Well, there's a new dynamic duo on the scene. That's TransFinders, RouteFinder Plus, and Wayfinder. RouteFinder Plus is TransFinders' award-winning industry-leading routing solution. And Wayfinder is the driver app that is changing the way drivers and subs approach their routes. Together, this pair provides the winning combination to help combat your school transportation woes, including driver shortage, inefficiencies, student discipline issues, while helping you improve the driver experience. RouteFinder Plus is intuitive, browser-based, and includes route optimization to help you build the most efficient routes possible. Way Wayfinder, the driver app, provides turn-by-turn instructions and allows users to take attendance and work seamlessly with Plus. You guys can learn more about this dynamic duo by emailing getplus at transfinder.com or giving them a call at 800-373-3609. All right, guys, we have an exciting interview coming up with Ryan and Kimberly Ellis. Let's get right to it, Mr. Gray. Let's welcome to the School Transportation Nation podcast stage, Kimberly Ellis. Kimberly, come on down. You're the next contestant. Good to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So you are the Director of Transportation for Marietta City Schools in Georgia. Uh, you've been the director there for about six years. And I think you've been there for a little bit longer, though you were an assistant director previous to that. Uh, first of all, why don't you tell your, our uh, listeners about you? How did you get involved in the industry? Absolutely. So I started out as a school bus driver and made my way from school bus driver um, up to a director. Um, it took me about maybe 15 minutes to figure out that I was in love with this industry. Hmm. The people are everything to me. And I started my career in Cobb and then moved to Marietta in 2012. And the rest is history. Yeah, so Cobb County, mm -hmm. they're nearby in, in Georgia. So you, like so many people in the industry, started as a school bus driver. Obviously, you remember those days. It's always good to be able to you know walk a mile in, the, in the, their shoes. Do you feel that that gives you a really great perspective to lead in or, the organization and to push some of the agenda ahead, especially some of the technology that we're going to talk about in a minute? Absolutely. I sure do. I think that it makes me um, more relatable to them. I think that I have an appreciation for just exactly how hard their job is. Um, and not just our bus drivers, but our monitors and our, our technicians as well. I try to spend time with each one of them and understand their roles. And I just think that that makes for a better team. Mm, absolutely. So first of all, let's talk about uh, Marietta City Schools sure. for, for a second here. How many buses are you guys running? You talked about drivers. How many drivers do you have? How many kids do you transport? So um, right now we have about a little over 8,700 kids in Marietta City Schools. Right now we transport anywhere between 6,300 and 6,400 of them. So that's a pretty significant percentage. Mm -hmm. We have um, 107 buses. I have five that are arriving this or hopefully, hopefully this week, right, with the supply chain. <laughs> We're hoping to make that 112 sooner than later. And we have uh, 73 regular routes and we run about 23 after school routes. And what about uh, transporting students with disabilities? Because I know that is also near and dear to your heart. 
Absolutely. We have about 15 different special education routes um, that we run every day. Okay. So uh, when we're talking about understanding what drivers go through, obviously one of the the big uh, hot button issues in the industry is illegal passing. Nothing new, um, unfortunately. And I think that certainly if you look at the the breadth of that National School Bus Loading and Unloading Survey, the numbers have gotten better in terms of student fatalities, but still far too many, far too many other injuries as well. You know, and there's a lot of aspects to that. I want to get your perspective on kind of the the swath there. But first, let's let's talk about illegal passing. Being a former driver, you I'm sure remember well seeing these motors pass. Did you have to? I mean, I, I've I've been reporting on this, the industry for about 20 years, and I know that when I first started. It was fairly common that school bus drivers would have like a piece of paper there with them and they'd have to jot, try to jot down while you're driving and you're pulled over and you're trying to make sure the kids are getting off right. And then you're, you're, you're expected to try to write down the, the incident and the, the license plate. Um, kind of take us through that. Tell us what you remember. And then, you know, what is Marietta City? And what have you guys been doing? Because you guys have been at the the cutting edge of this to try and thwart illegal passers. Sure. So, um, yes, back in the day, um, we would have to try to capture a license plate and then call it into our dispatcher over the radio (laughs) while trying to drive. So, yeah, we've come a long way since then. Uh, Marietta's really prioritized student safety by making sure that all of our route buses have stop arm cameras on them. And so aside for the ones that would occasionally go out of service, all of our routes run each day with stop arm cameras in it. I would say that we've definitely seen, we went through a period where we saw a huge uptake in violations, um, but once we were able to get our entire fleet outfitted with them, um, we've definitely seen a reduction. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned you have it fleet wide. Um, And now, you know, remind me again, you said you said you, you should have around 112 buses or so, depending on kind of a new order. Correct. But some of those are spares. So our spares aren't all equipped with them, but our regular routes, buses that go out every single day are. Okay. And you guys, you guys uh, work with Vera Mobility, who happens to be one of the sponsors of this podcast. And so, you know, how long have you been working with them? Sure. And tell us a little bit about the program too, because I know that some folks, I think, you know, out there know about it, but, you know, take us through that, that relationship and how does that work? Because there are several, of course, um, options out there to student transporters, basically anyone that sells school bus surveillance has has that kind of option now, but kind of take right. us through that process. Absolutely. So we actually started with American Traffic Solutions and when Vera Mobility bought them out, mm-hmm. we just sort of transferred over to them because we were already a client. But Vera's been great. Um, we've enjoyed working with them. Our account rep's great. His name is Orlando Torres. We work with him very close, as well as Sherry Lewis. We, When we first started with them back in 2019, 2020, we were like on our, on our national stop arm survey. We um, recorded 177 violations. And in this past year, when we just did it, we were down to 92. Okay. So we're definitely seeing a decrease in violations due to the cameras. But I will say there's still way too many. Um, I just actually pulled a report and they issued 3,357 citations since the beginning of this school year. So we've been able to issue citations to that many people who have passed our school buses illegally. And those are those aren't the ones that were thrown out. Those are the actual citations issued. So that's an alarming number to me. Mm-hmm. Um, that's just an awful lot of chances to take with students' lives. Absolutely. So, you, you know, you've seen roughly about a 25% decrease, but like you said, it's still happening far too often. So it, it has impacted driver behavior, at least some. Absolutely. I think the, the $60,000 question is, is there, are we ever going to solve illegal passers? And if so, or, or what you, from your, your standpoint, what needs to be done? Yeah, I think we just need to be consistent with our message across the board. I would love to see other districts take on this project. Um, I feel like if if everyone's doing it, we can send a louder message. I just, you know, my 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 plea to the public would be to just please stop. Just it takes a second. And at the end of the day, whatever any one of us are doing is not more important than the life of a child. Mm, absolutely. And, and, you know, kind of piggybacking on that, curious your thoughts on what role does the school district play in influencing that discussion? Now, a lot, I know a lot of districts 
have PSAs. They work with the local media, especially at school startup time. You know, so you know you see those back to school segments and whatnot. But even in terms of novice driver training, a lot of those programs are within the district. I um, want to you know find out from you: do, do, Is your department engaged or do anything with other programs within the district, or at least you know throughout the community? Sure. So we work really closely with Marietta Police Department. We have a great partnership with them on multiple levels. But yes, we absolutely do. We try to get the word out. We're at our um, school's PTSA meetings. So we're able to communicate to the public via that, which is mostly our parents who end up in our school zones. Marietta being where it sits is we're literally five miles from the Atlanta Braves Stadium Mm -hmm. and you have to pass through us to get to downtown Atlanta. So we have a lot of folks um, that are travel through Marietta. So I don't think that the primary violators are necessarily from Marietta as much as it is is the commuters traveling through it. We've done a pretty good job at educating our public, Mm -hmm. we feel like. Um, So we think that probably a lot of it is through traffic. Gotcha. And then, you know, I was mentioning earlier, you know, total school bus stop safety, because I was mentioning that a national school bus loading and unloading survey. And if you look at the numbers over the 50 plus years, you know, there's still more students historically who have been hit and killed by their own school bus. Absolutely. Than, than illegal. And so, you know, kind of you're, you're interested in your thoughts on that, that we don't forget about that. Um, and what are some of the things that Marietta City is doing maybe with your driver training? I know you're also big on on driver training there in Marietta City schools. Sure, absolutely. So we have an extensive driver training program. We, we spend probably more, and I'm proud to say this, we probably spend more time doing safety and training. We meet with our drivers monthly to do safety trainings with them. But what we've done um, in addition to take it to the next step is, is we have spent and invested an awful lot of time and budget in student training and what their responsibility is around in and around the school bus, teaching them about the 12-foot danger zone. Um, and that program is called SOAR. And we literally, they go through five stations where we actually pull a bus up to their school. They get to emergency evacuate out the back. They learn how to cross the street. We do a two finger sweep with them so that they know where to stop and look at the driver and when to cross. Um, They learn that if the driver blows the horn, that that means danger. And they need to pay attention to the driver to see which side of the road they need to go to. So we've done a lot of things to be proactive. And thank goodness we haven't had to deal with any sort of fatality in Marietta. Yeah, good. Yeah. You know, switching gears just just slightly, last week the federal government officially ended this COVID-19 pandemic era, right, right that we were in. And I know you, you know, Marietta uh, City made uh, some headlines a few years ago, kind of right in the middle of the the, you know, major onslaught of COVID, I guess, for some initiatives that you guys were, were taking on. It's been interesting to, to us here at STN looking at that evolution where, you know, so much was forced on school districts and there was so much money toward just intense cleaning. And I think a lot of the studies showed that after maybe it was, you know, time and money not as well spent as because it was an airborne virus, right? But yet, you know, you guys really took a lead and you were, you, you involved a lot of technology and you were actually part of a CDC study, mm-hmm. correct? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So our superintendent worked with uh, really closely with the CDC on that study. Um, and just, we were very open with numbers and people out and we did a lot of contact tracing. We had drivers literally turning in seating charts. We would update them every day on Google Drive to see who was sitting next to who. We had um, hired extra employees as a separate monitor on the bus that would literally step off the bus and take kids' temperatures prior to loading the bus. And then if they had a fever, we had a system where we would pick up the students. So anyway, it was, it was yes, it, it was a lot. We're glad it's over. <laughs> and now, so now is all that stuff thrown out? I mean, what, what you know, because we're one of the things that we're looking at is obviously we have the school bus driver shortage, right? Sure. And, you know, uh, trying to keep those folks behind the seat. You know, there's a lot, you know, a lot of discussion that I've been looking at lately. And it's really nothing new, but school bus drivers tend to call in sick. Right. And there are a lot of times they're they're guaranteed, you know, so many sick days a year and it's can be quite extensive. We've had a lot of conversations, obviously, about, you know, pay and maybe that's not commensurate. But I want to get your thoughts being a former driver on, you know, how 
maybe Marietta City Schools or maybe the industry can use some of those lessons learned from COVID to better protect their drivers um, and their students? Sure. So I will tell you, as far as like the driver shortage goes, Ryan, culture, 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 culture. Heard that many times. Culture and pay are the two things. Like you have to provide a, a good working environment. If people don't feel valued and appreciated, they are not going to want to come to work and they're certainly not going to want to do a good job for you. When they do feel that way, they will. I'm happy and so proud to say that we we have a waiting list right now at Marietta, mm. but we have been very intentional about, about building that culture where our drivers feel valued and appreciated. Um, we do things. We have cookouts. We have picnics. We have celebrations. We have award ceremonies for them all throughout the year. We don't just celebrate them one time a year. We have gotten in there and fought. And I will say we have a wonderful board of education. Marietta literally has got to be the best place in the world to work. We have a great board. We have a wonderful superintendent, a great chief operations officer, and literally our drivers starting ready to pay if the board blesses our budget, which we certainly hope they will, will be $27.69 to start as a driver. Great. That's pretty solid. And so we just said Absolutely. we could get our drivers on a level playing field where they're not having to worry about mm -hmm. going home and whether their lights are on or their water's been cut off just so that they are able to pay their bills. Then they can come to work and focus on what they really need to be focused on in that student safety. Yeah. And this district's really embraced that. And what, uh, you know, I've, I've also been following, you know, there's been a trend toward guaranteed hours, guaranteed, trying to get them to sure. maybe not 40, but close to it to get them more in that full time, you know, envelope, you know, what are you guys doing with that? Yeah, so we've addressed that. So our drivers, um, we give them the opportunity to have a second job so they can truly make this a full-time position. Um, so they would come in and drive routes in the morning and we've opened up our monitors in our cafeteria so they can go and work in the lunchroom in between routes. We have like an inner office mail service that transportation runs. So that's an extra job for them to sign up for. Extra people on the ground at our high school they're, they can do that. So we've allowed opportunities um, in multiple areas for them to be able to turn what is a, traditionally a five or six hour a day job into a, 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 an eight hour a day job. Mm. And, and all of that, you know, again, if the board passes at that $27 an hour. Well, so so the the second job rates vary. Different tiers. OK, gotcha. Different, yeah. yeah. But the, while they're driving, that's still that's still wonderful. And our top out pay will be thirty nine twenty if if the board blesses it. So that's pretty that's pretty solid living. So wow. Well, I, I would I would invite everyone to um, out there listening to go apply at Marietta City. But it sounds like you're going to be in line. <laughs> sounds like there's there's uh, several people in front of you now. I wanted I wanted to ask you, Kimberly. You said that you had that that uh, waiting list, but is is that because? You're, you have no more room for folks. Is it because, I mean, what about like, you know, we've heard about that, you know, it's, and it's nothing new and it was exacerbated during COVID, the wait time to try to get through the DMV, get them through testing. We have the entry level driver training rules now. And in some states, you know, um, already kind of had it figured out or had a process. They had to do some more administrative stuff. Other, other districts or states had to really, you know, do a lot of work. Kind of what's that whole driver CDL certification issue looking like for you guys? Sure. So we jumped in at the very beginning when we knew it was coming. I have a wonderful lead trainer. I've got great people. This is not a one person show at Marietta. This is a group effort. I have a great staff and great employees. Um, but we were on top of it right from the beginning. So it turned, it turned out not to be as big of an issue for us. We were pretty prepared for it. Our Department of Education consultants are great too. They worked with us and help us. We meet in recess each month. And um, through that, we've just been able to get all the support we need to get all these things in order, at least here in Metro Atlanta. Great, great. So, you know, you were talking about uh, driver and staff satisfaction, kind of coming back to what we were talking about earlier, technology, how that plays into it. Sure. Obviously, you know, the buses, right? How how nice are they? Are they in the newer buses? Are they have the, all the ergonomic, you know, bells and whistles, you know, the tools like you were mentioning contact tracing before. I imagine that's transitioned to, or maybe you're already using it for like student tracking. I know that's one of been one of the big, biggest I guess, uh, technology influencers um, that we've seen in the market over the last several years and really just kind of trending upward. 
Sure, absolutely. We have a routing software with the parent app that our parents are able to follow their students bus with the GPS that gets uploaded through the parent app. And we recently, a couple of years ago, introduced um, transportation ID cards. So all of our students are issued an RFID transportation card and they um, scan on and scan off as they're getting off the bus. Um, for our younger kids, we just think it's attached to their backpack. And so when they're going on and off the bus, it sends an electronic ping to the parent app. So not only do our parents are able to track when the bus is going to arrive at their stop, they're actually able to get a notification that tells them what time their student got on the bus and where they got on the bus at. And the same thing in the afternoon. So if you had a student that was getting off at a bus stop that they shouldn't be, the parent would get an immediate notification saying your student just exited the bus at an, you know, at not at their regular stop. So for safety reasons, um, we absolutely love this. Um, it absolutely helps us at the beginning of the school year too, making sure we have all the students on the correct buses because we're able to pull a list and look. And then if one gets accidentally put on a wrong bus, we're able to find where they are very quickly. So using that technology, to my point, you know, helping make the driver's jobs a little bit easier. Uh, I'm, so I'm curious, you know, are they scanning on the students? Is it RFID? Do you guys have tablets for the drivers? I know, you know, there's turn to turn navigation. Yeah, we have. So they all we have tablets on all of our buses. They have the RFID readers. We have the stop arm cameras. And then we have obviously we have the internal cameras as well. Absolutely. And with those internal cameras, you know, and external too, you know, we've been also tracking AI as as everybody has, right? There AI is in the news right now a lot. Yes. You know, more so for on, on this standpoint that we're looking at is AI for routing. And we have, there's that, so those solutions out there now. Also, we, were t- we talked a lot about video AI for video detecting different things, whether it be in the danger zone or on the bus, pre- kind of more that getting in that predictive modeling. Curious what any research you've been doing on that and kind of what your thoughts, again, being a former driver of things you would like to see technology continue to help you guys address. Yeah. So for the the AI technology, so we're always interested in anything that can help keep a student safe. So as far as like around the danger zone, any kind of notification that video could give us is and alert the driver. Um, We think that's a positive. Where we're not interested in it is any sort of facial recognition or anything like that. So we've got some folks that are starting to talk about that. And at this time, we're not interested at all in pursuing that. But um, as far as in and around the bus, absolutely. Mm-hmm. If it will keep help keep our kids safe. Absolutely. And in terms of technology, you know, it'd be uh, remiss of me not to ask you about green bus technology. Yeah. I know that uh, one of your neighbors has Georgia's first electric school bus. It's Fulton County. <laughs> Curious. Tell me a little bit about Marietta City's plans. Are you using any alternative fuels now or biodiesel blends with your diesel? What's your interest in electric? I want to get your thoughts on that. Sure. So we um, actually applied for the EPA grant the first round. Um, We were not selected. I will say that, however, we have um, eight propane buses, which we absolutely love. Our drivers love them. Our students seem to love them. Our technicians like enjoy working on them. And we've got five more ordered that should hopefully be here within the next week or so. So we're excited to receive those. And so we will continue to apply for grants and look at new opportunities as far as alternative fuel goes. But right now we're very excited about the propane. Awesome. Good. Well, you guys have a great operation out there. I know i um, seen some great news we've reported on uh, Marietta City several times over the past years. Um, it's great to you know spend some time with you, Kimberly. And Take a look under the hood, if you will, a little bit at at your operation. So uh, I want to thank you very much for taking time out of your busy day to to talk with us in the nation. Absolutely. Thank you so much. A special thanks to Kimberly, Ryan, all our sponsors this week, TransFinder, First Student, and Vera Mobility. We appreciate you guys sponsoring this episode of the podcast. Guys, don't forget, visit stnonline.com for all the latest and greatest school bus industry news. Also, don't forget stnexpo.com. We got that early bird registration. Save 100 for STN Expo in Reno, July 14th through the 19th. 
16th, just in case you missed Indy, but you still want to go. You guys can register on site when you arrive. We're about two weeks away or so, so can't wait to see you June 2nd through the 6th in Indy down at the convention center. If you need a room, Crown Plaza, Omni, those are the places to go. Or you can always reach out to the STN team. That's events at stnmedia.com. If you guys have any questions, we're happy to help. Don't forget this podcast. It's on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to pods. And we're here every week, guys. We love you. We're glad you're listening. See you next week. Bye.